Hello beautiful people, welcome to Mimsy Bids. I am Marwa aka Mimsy and today I'm going to talk about the four main reasons why people are Muslim. So why they believe Islam is the true religion. So it won't include things such as there must be more to life and the other questions that actually many other religions will also have answers to and will have similarities to Islam. What I wanted to pinpoint for this video is basically why Islam, why specifically Islam, what makes you think actually Islam must be the truth because of this. So after speaking to many Muslims about this, there were four things that kept coming up. So I'm basically gonna go through those four reasons why they believe Islam to be true. As a side note also, when I was Muslim, these were things that I also valued and thought this is the reason why it must be true. The first one is the Quran itself. So basically that the Quran itself is a miracle because of its beauty and eloquence and the way that it's been constructed. You know, there's no way that that could have been a human construction. It's got to be from a God because of its perfection. Because of that, it's often said, you know, well, if you try and create something like the Quran, you won't be able to, is basically what Muslims believe. But also that it was brought by the Prophet Muhammad who actually was illiterate, you know, and it's this kind of, well, how can an illiterate man come up with such beauty and eloquence? You know, that must mean that it's a miracle and that it's straight from God. It's understood by Muslims that the classical Quranic Arabic is so, so beautiful. And you know, the Arabs of that time were just in awe of its beauty. So I obviously have a few problems with this. Firstly, the basic concept of beauty. Beauty is absolutely subjective. It is totally in the eye of the beholder. There could be arguments about whether William Shakespeare is better than William Wordsworth. You could argue about beauty with anything, but it wouldn't really make any sense because it's just dependent on that person's personal point of view. There are very nice passages in the Quran, but you could also say there's very nice, beautiful pieces of writing throughout the centuries, throughout the world, from many, many people who don't claim it to be from a god. As I mentioned before, you know, Shakespeare, Wordsworth, you know, they're, they're classics, you know, even the Islamic poet Rumi, you know, the works that he's done have been so stunningly beautiful and many people are kind of mesmerized by people's words. That alone, wouldn't make something from a god. So there are so many amazing works, but also we wouldn't really be able to recreate them exactly. If someone said, I want you to recreate Rumi's work exactly as it was, or I want you to create a, a full play that Shakespeare would have done exactly as he would have done it, no one would be able to recreate anything that someone else has done. And the point also of Muhammad being illiterate was also not something that was unusual. Most people were illiterate at that time. And actually a lot of those illiterate people would recite kind of stories and poetry on the spot. You know, it was very much a part of that culture. And in fact, you know, the Prophet Muhammad had composed the Quran over 23 years. So really there's nothing that miraculous about it. A lot of Muslims actually don't speak Arabic or know the classical Arabic will often just take this at face value though, where their teacher will just say to them, these words are so perfect, you don't really understand them, but they really, really are perfect and, and the most eloquent thing you'll ever see in your life. And there's a huge assumption about how the Arabs were in agreement essentially about its perfection. But the reality is Arabs at that time and many years after had criticized the Quran and disagreed that it was very eloquent and actually have criticized it on certain grammatical errors and certain constructional errors. So there's a really good example of a person called El Razi. Now he basically was very well known within the Arab golden age. So he was a philosopher and a physician. And he basically said that the Quran was absolutely not perfect and that basically a thousand of those could be created. And there are many others. I'll actually put some down below. There are some people also within the Muslim community that will say the Quran isn't perfect. An 11th century Sunni scholar that basically said, look, we do not claim that the Quran is the highest rank of eloquence. And by the way, I'm only talking about the writings of the Quran. I haven't even gone into the context, but I feel like that's a whole nother thing. So the second thing that I hear all the time that basically Islam must be true because there are scientific miracles in the Quran that they shouldn't have known at that time. It was way beyond their time and so it being in there means it must be from God because obviously God created the world he knows all the science I remember being at university and I was part of the 
ISOC, so the Islamic Association basically. And I remember this being like such a big deal. I was actually so excited about it as well. I remember thinking, oh my God, this is so cool that we have literal proof that we can literally say, and it's a nice way of giving dawah as well. I thought, you know, kind of like telling people about Islam because we could be like, dude, like we have science in our book. At the time, I remember it feeling so factual and such a solid reason for why Islam must be true. So when I did look more into it, I remember feeling just really embarrassed. It's almost like Muslims only research themselves. Like they don't really look beyond the Islamic world. The ancient Greeks, the ancient Egyptians, Hindus, these ancient civilizations had a wealth of knowledge that actually did pass down to these areas of the Arab Peninsula. All the other thing they'll do is just really try and fit in, you know, the science that we now know into something that's quite ambiguous in the Quran and kind of almost could possibly relate to what they're talking about. So I'll give you some examples, but I feel like I could actually just make a whole video on this because there's so many. For example, the stages of the embryo in the womb are described in the Quran. And that was something that was discovered by the ancient Greeks. So they did have kind of the stages and the understanding of that already, basically. And in fact, they're both quite limited. You know, there, there is so much more actually to the embryo that we know now. Another one is that there's a verse about iron being sent down. And obviously iron comes from a meteorite. So it's kind of basically supposed to be a scientific miracle that they're telling you iron was sent down in a meteorite. We sent down iron with its great inherent strength and its many benefits for humankind. The fact that iron came down to earth from outer space is something which could not be known by the primitive science of the 7th century. This is one of the many examples of when a scientific thing is almost trying to fit into a verse. Because actually the verse of being sent down, that word that was described of things being sent down, is used many times and in many contexts. You know, there's another verse that says that God had sent down clothes, but it's not that clothes were sent in meteorites. And even if it did mean that, it was also known. The ancient Egyptians actually called iron metal of heaven. And there, and there were similar writings in the ancient Greek works as well. And also so if that was a point to show the scientific miracle in the Quran, the truth is it's actually showing how limited its understanding is anyway because many elements came from the sky. So if it is just describing just iron, why is it describing just iron when there's so many other elements that have come down? The Greek philosopher and physician, he basically always described fertilization as a mixture of fluids and you know often spoke about kind of the male fluid and female fluids, fluids coming together and that sort of thing. The description is similar to the description description of fertilization which is in the Quran also which is described as a fluid coming from the backbone sort of rib area basically. If this were to be a real miracle is if it had said there's a fluid that comes from the testicles. Um, if it had kind of described that, I think that would have been a bit more of a shock factor of like, oh my God, this is undiscovered scientific miracle. Or even just mentioned an egg, you know, because that those are things that weren't really known. But anyway, you get the point guys. The scientific miracles in the Quran are just not scientific miracles at all. They were things that were known at that time. Or it's just Muslims really trying hard to fit things into kind of ambiguous sentences or sometimes both. Which leads me to my third reason which is the prophet Muhammad himself. So I heard and also I believed obviously that prophet Muhammad was such a perfect human being and honourable man that basically Islam must be true because of him alone. I remember being told as, as a child you know you need to love the prophet so much, you love him more than your parents, you love him more than yourself. You have to love him so much. I think in a way I did convince myself that I loved him, but I do remember thinking it's really hard to love him because he's not there. So I kind of did read a lot of his stories. And I remember as a small kid thinking, do you know what? I don't like the idea of death, but if I die and then I get to meet the Prophet Muhammad, that's really exciting. It definitely is something that becomes very embedded in Muslims, this kind of love for him. So he's believed to be a perfect man, you know, a role model, someone that you really look up to and he is who you should aspire to be like. In fact, it's so hard to be like him, you have to just be a little bit like him. So the main things that Muslims often bring up when they're describing the Prophet Muhammad are things like, you know, even before he brought about the Quran and brought the message, he was known as someone that was trustworthy. So he was actually known as Al Sadiq and Al Amin, which is the truthful and the trustworthy. So he always had these good characteristics. I remember when I was at Islamic school, you know, something that we heard so much was, you know, even his enemies loved him. There's a story that I remember always being told that there was this enemy of the Prophet who basically said to the Prophet, look, 
I'll give you anything you want, all the wealth and riches, whatever. But just stop all this stuff and just listen to me, okay? And the prophet basically refused everything and just said, I don't want any of this stuff. And he just started to recite some Quran. And the enemy just said, you know what? This is a decent, nice guy. And he kind of said to his people like, back off, leave him alone let him do his thing. Also something that I really cherished when I was a Muslim was that he was very generous. So within his seerah, you know, the story of the Prophet basically, it is described how the Prophet wouldn't even be able to sleep without giving away any money or any food that he had on him. So if he had one dinar on him, he just wouldn't go to sleep until he's given it to a poor person or someone that needed it. I loved that idea. I thought that was so cute. And also at that time, they used to cherish boys over girls. So they would actually bury their daughters. So, you know, when they had a daughter, they would just bury her alive because she basically wasn't helpful to them in any way. And they wanted an heir, which is in a boy, basically. So basically the Prophet Muhammad disagreed with that and thought that was a completely wrong practice and he stopped that from happening. So in the same sira, there's a story about his encounter with a tribe called Beni El Quraiza. And basically this tribe had a few leaders that decided to side with the Meccans. Now the Meccans were opposing the Prophet Muhammad. So what he decided to do is he built a huge trench and he went to that tribe and killed every single man and boy that had pubic hair. So basically in his mind that hit puberty. So it could be as young as 12 or 13, but he made sure to cut off everyone's heads and then he put them in this trench that he built. And their women and children, of course, became slaves. The number of men is roughly between 600 to 900, so a lot of people died. And there are many similar stories like this one of when the prophet and his companions went to various tribes. There's one example which I've mentioned before of when they went to a Jewish tribe and he beheaded the father, the brother, and the husband of a woman called Sophia who he decided he wanted to marry so he married her that night that he'd killed everyone and also consummated their marriage that night. He also says many violent things for example he who leaves religion kill him, do not initiate salam to a Jew or a Christian and if you do meet them in the street make sure to push them to the narrowest side of it. Anyway you guys get the point there are many things that he did that are morally questionable and in no way should be put up on a pedestal. So moving on to the fourth and final main point, basically the fear factor, hellfire. So hellfire obviously is a really scary concept. I've actually had so many people say to me, you know, since I've left Islam, look, just ignore all the things that you're having problems with because at the end of the day, you don't want to have to face hell. You don't want to go to hellfire. You can see that that is a massive pull factor for people, the fear of going to hellfire. So even if you have disagreements within Islam or things that you don't like about Islam, the idea that you could potentially go to hell hell for eternity and be tortured with fire and all the horrible things that can happen to you. That fear is strong man, like people don't want that to happen so they'll literally do anything, they'll follow through, they'll ignore their doubt. But hell is super interesting to me, if you look at the background of where hell actually came from, so if we look at the Abrahamic religion, so Judaism actually doesn't really talk about hell, it doesn't really talk about heaven either. When you die it's kind of just a grey area, it's just kind of like meh, nothing, it's not here nor there, whatever. Hell really came about in Christianity. So there was a valley near Jerusalem called Jehenom in Hebrew and basically that place actually was used by the pagans where they would do sacrificial rituals. So they would burn young children and they would burn animals and they just burnt lots of things. And actually that valley started to really smell and it had such a pungent smell because of all the dead bodies and all the disgusting things that they used to do there. So they actually started to keep a constant fire there just to keep the smell down basically. So even after the pagans they still use that place as a fire pit and they would continue to burn animals and also criminals like after criminals had died rather than burying them or whatever they'd actually go and just burn them in that pit as well so obviously that place Jehennob it became this kind of horrible place that no one really wants to go to and it got associated with kind of evil people as well you know in that area and location and that the evil criminals will get burnt there after they've died. So that got taken into the kind of Christian teachings of punishment, which actually became very useful in the political sphere of religion. And actually, if you research into the history of just religions generally, they were often used as a power tool, as a control tool, and also as bringing people together in the kind of empire world of how things used to be. So the Romans, for example, when they became a Christian state, you know, the, the use of hellfire actually became really, really useful to them. And 
there used to be many kind of torturous things that they would do to punish people. But at the end of the day, a fear of eternal punishment in this pit of fire by a god was so much more scarier and used as a great tool for them to say, listen, you need to listen to us as a Christian state, otherwise you'll get punished in hellfire. Now that's super scary, so you better listen to us. When I was a Muslim, hellfire was something that really I tried to avoid, to be honest with you. I didn't really want to read the descriptions. I remember having to read them in my Islamic studies or my Quran class, and I remember just thinking, this is so gory and disgusting and horrible. And it always has been such a juxtaposition. You know, it's the most merciful, merciful God, the most merciful, someone who's more merciful than your mum, more merciful than anyone you can think of that's merciful. God is more merciful than them. And to put that next to eternal torture of the most gruesome kind as well, of how hot lava will be poured into your ears, of how your eyeballs will be coming out, boiling water poured into your skin, your skin will keep recreating itself so that you can be burnt and burnt and burnt over and over and over. It's so gruesome and evil that I couldn't understand and don't understand how that would come from and be done by a pure good merciful God and obviously understanding the historical background of hell and just generally how religions work and many many other things it starts to make sense of how these things are just very man-made but I've got to be honest with you I was never really excited about the idea of heaven either heaven is described as being very shallow very materialistic all about lust and greed there's an area that always broke my heart and that is that there the people of heaven will basically be sneering at the people in hell so they'll actually be able to see the people in hell and the people in hell will call out to people in heaven and say please help us you know give us some food can you give us anything basically and the people in heaven will kind of just laugh at them and say haha no you know this is what you deserve haha sucker is that what people would become when they go to heaven just very shallow empty robotic people that have absolutely no empathy that you would sneer at people that are suffering? Is that something I'd be excited about? The truth is when it comes to religion, there is generally an emotional attachment to it. So I find it really funny when people like Ali Dawa basically say that ex-Muslims have left for emotional reasons. When the truth is to leave Islam, we had to detach our emotional attachment to it. There is a huge emotional attachment to Islam, particularly for people that have been brought up around an entire close-knit community. It's everything to you. It's your family, it's your friends, it's your life, it's your day in, it's your day out. So that emotional attachment to your identity of where you come from or where you belong needs to be detached, which obviously would be a very big reason why people would want to believe in the religion or would want to stay in the religion or want to understand and make sense of the religion. Anyway guys, thanks so much for watching. Like this video and subscribe to my channel and I'll see you guys soon. Stay in touch. Mwah.